from John 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. I have revealed you to those whom you gave out to the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. The word of the Lord. I know the reading was long this morning. I. It could have been longer, though, because that wasn't the whole 17th chapter of John. <laughs> but I know we have a tolerance, and I don't want to exceed it. But it really almost physically hurt me every time I had to, like, cut a phrase or something. I, I can't stand it. I think of it as Jesus' last words. I, I know that it's not really Jesus' last words. There's more recorded other occasions, and he speaks more. But those words, it does seem to me, have an air of transition and of finality. It is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. Most of the prayers Jesus prayed, as we know he prayed, we don't know what they were. And the few that we do know are much shorter than this. This prayer was prayed, as John records it, on the night just before the crucifixion. So I think of Jesus praying, and his mind is already walking out into the dark. It's just a powerful picture in my mind. You might say, well, beautiful, but I thought this was a sermon series on the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is. You just can't see it yet, <laughs> so hold on. John, who wrote this gospel, again, in a, in a miraculous way, received this prayer. How could John possibly have remembered this prayer, even if he had heard it? So John somehow receives this prayer by the Holy Spirit and writes it down so that now we can hear it. 
and we can recognize the work of the Spirit of God in and through every word. I think that's a challenge. It's a challenge with any scripture, but it's specifically a challenge with the 17th chapter of John because like five or six other passages of scripture in my mind, and I would say that Hebrews 11 is another one, pay attention to that later, these passages are so meticulously crafted. I mean, the words in Greek and in many good translations are so meticulously crafted and so gloriously inspired that they're mesmerizing. Listen again, close your eyes if you want to, to a few verses to see if you can hear the effect that I'm describing. This is Jesus praying. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. See how it circles around? It's almost impossible to analyze. I have, I have worked on this passage for decades. It's really impossible to analyze. It sounds like he's being verbose. You know, if you were teaching a comp class, you'd say, slash that, you're repeating yourself 15,000 times. Why do you keep saying that? Well, as somebody said in a recent sermon, when somebody repeats something over and over and over, emphasis, repeating for emphasis, well, Jesus is talking to God, the Father. He doesn't have to say it twice, but he does. Maybe because he knew it would be recorded as Holy Scripture, or maybe because it just was that important. But somehow... You and I have to do the hard work of reading carefully and analyzing linguistically and rhetorically so that as we are enabled by the Holy Spirit, we can get a little grasp on what it is Jesus is saying. Specifically, what he is saying about three things. What he is saying about Christian unity. What is it? How can it be we experience it? And why should we want to? So that's what the sermon is about today, Christian unity. The word unity appears very rarely in this passage, but Jesus keeps saying one, 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 over and over. They may be one, they may be one, as we are one, you and me, I and you, you and me, I and them, they and me, over and over and over, unity. So what is that? And how can we experience it? How can we feel it? How can we know it? And then why should we want to? Allow me to start with a diagram. Now, before you even start laughing, let me just say, I think structurally. I think if I had had another life, I would have been a geometry teacher because I think geometrically. I, I think structurally. But I am not a graphic artist, <laughs> so just be aware. So I, we're going to put up a slide here if, if it comes up, and you'll see this little diagram. Okay, chuckle, get it over with. But bear with me, I'm trying to explain something, okay? The large heart represents God, obviously. Because, I'm using a heart, not a circle or a triangle or whatever, because Jesus says in this prayer, listen, Father, I want, you, I want those you have given me to be with me and to see the glory you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Think about that. The love of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit before the creation of the world. If I had three arms, I'd be doing that three times. And have loved them, even as you have loved me. So the whole thing starts with love. In other words, and this is just a really quick review, but I'm going to use this crude depiction. Jesus enjoyed love with God the Father before the world began. And from that immeasurable love, that incomprehensibly majestic love, God sent Jesus into the world on a mission. And the mission was basically twofold. To make God known. Think about it. He's the creator. We're the creation. How would we know him? The Bible says nature, but Jesus is the best way. So Jesus is to make God known and also then to bring God's love into the world. So the crossed line, as you see there, Jesus, okay? To fulfill that mission on earth, we know Jesus taught and preached. He did miracles and then eventually sacrificed himself. 
He took the death on himself to take the punishment on himself, to take the pain on himself that he didn't deserve, but every other human being did and does. He took that on himself so that he could reconcile every single human being to God. Now, that doesn't mean every single human being accepts the reconciliation and trusts Jesus' sacrifice, but he died once for everyone. Then the Holy Spirit enters. I'm going to ask you for that slide again, if you you can hear me, that that diagram slide again. The Holy Spirit sent by the Father then and the Son comes into creation and births new life in that believer, in that reconciled person. The Holy Spirit then is a divine gift. He comes and seals that person's adoption as a child of God. So we've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And it'll come up in a minute because Mary's going in there. But if you can remember the diagram, there's a heart, there's a line, there's a little circle at the bottom. What's the little circle? That's not the Holy Spirit, believe me. If I were making the Holy Spirit, I'd make a great old big circle around the Holy Spirit. The little circle is a person. Is a person. Because when we think about the gospel, thank you, Mary, we think about individual salvation. I said a minute ago, Jesus died once for everyone, but that doesn't mean everyone is saved. We are not universalists, or at least I'm not, in the strictest sense of the phrase. I'm not a universalist. So the Holy Spirit comes and Uh, seals the adoption of that little person. Now, that's a ridiculously simplistic depiction. I know that. And you may not think like I do. You may not think in geometric designs. You may not, you know, think about salvation in those ways. You may think of it differently. But no matter how you think of it, each of us has our own mental construct, mental picture of what it means to be Christian, how you get to be Christian and what it means to be Christian. It may be a story. It may be a depiction. It may be whatever. But it behooves us as we try to understand Jesus' prayer and try to enter into it and receive it to consider how our personal concepts relate to the one that Jesus is describing in his prayer. Did you ever get a song stuck in your head? I think they sometimes call them earworms. It's a disgusting phrase. I refuse to use it. But you know what I mean? You just start thinking about something. Well, all week long, I've been preparing this sermon, and all week long, I've been hearing this song in my head, really just one phrase of it. It's a song from way back. One version of it is like 1940s, another version 1960s, so, you know, the dawn of time. But I keep thinking about this phrase because, to me, it really annoyingly captures what I call the privatized gospel. The privatized gospel. The name of the song and the refrain line is Just Jesus and Me. It's sort of a cowboy song. Just Jesus. You can just hear it hippie hoppy hippie. It's Jesus and Me. So whenever that phrase sort of wiggles into my thinking, it conjures up in my mind, I'm not kidding, this is really true, sort of a, a picture, a fantastical picture of an endless stream of born again individuals each walking hand in hand with Jesus into the mists of eternity, seemingly oblivious to the billions upon billions of others who appear to be experiencing the same person-to-person salvation, just Jesus and me, just Jesus and me. If you Google Jesus and me, believe you me, not only will you get that song, but you'll get gobs of photos. I mean, this this is a thing. This idea that it's just Jesus and me. I used to think it was C.S. Lewis who said this. He didn't. And if you know who did, I'd love to know. Someone, some theologian at one point said that we are essentially alone on a plane with God. Not P-L-A-N-E, but P-L-A-I-N, with God. Like alone on a plane with God. I don't know what was meant by that expression, but it's the same kind of thinking. But Jesus' prayer doesn't paint that picture. Jesus isn't praying about one person, individual persons. Jesus says, I pray for those who will believe in me that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, that they may be one as we are and they may be brought to complete unity. Jesus is talking about all. So here's the quandary. How do we reconcile that divine vision of unity with what I would 
believe is a pretty widespread concept of privatized salvation. Just Jesus and me. You know, just Jesus and me. It's going to be okay. Jesus is my best friend, that kind of thinking. So what is the unity that Jesus prays for? He prays for oneness. So what is that? If it's not one to one, you know, me and Jesus and God, what is it? Is it a, a moral imperative? Is, is it something that we ought to do, some commandment, like be unified, be one, get along, you kids quit fighting, you know, that kind of thing. Or is it an ideal, just a, sort of a, a shining goal that we should keep before us? Is unity a reality? Is there such a thing as unity? Well, let me try to, try to clarify as much as I can. Jesus is not praying about a human organization. That's the first thing we need to check off the list. He is praying about the spiritual unity of Christians. Human organizations, whether we're talking about businesses or families or, you know, uh, clubs or sororities, fraternities, you know, teams, whatever, human organizations are, are collectives. They are coalitions. They are gatherings, if you will. Individuals who come together for their own purposes. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Purposes may be perfectly fine. They may be actually righteous, just purposes. But Jesus isn't praying about that. Because Christian unity doesn't begin with individual human beings. It starts with God. That's the first thing to remember when you're trying to understand the concept of unity. And it's important. God is one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one. And God has made the entire Christian communion, the entirety of Christianity, in all times and all places, one. That doesn't mean that Christians have to be together physically. It doesn't mean that Christians have to be connected administratively, governmentally. It doesn't mean that Christians have to think the same thing. It doesn't mean that Christians have to have the same opinions. It doesn't mean they have to vote the same. Hot news. All Christians don't have to have the same ideas or opinions. Unity isn't the same thing as uniformity. That's the second thing to remember. Unity starts with God. Unity is not uniformity. Christian unity isn't based on situation or similarity. Christians are united by God the Holy Spirit. This is the way Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians. This is a short passage of a longer passage. Just as the body, now he's talking about the bo like a body, a human body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, we Christians were baptized into one, by one spirit, so we form one body. All Christians were baptized by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, so that we form one body. Now you are the body of Christ. Paul is writing to the Christians in Corinth, but he's also writing to us. Christians, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You've heard this metaphor used a great deal in the New Testament, talking about spiritual gifts and a lot of other things. The body metaphor is a big metaphor. A person is a Christian. I'm using that quote thing because that word is tossed around so much, and it seems to mean so many different things. A person is a Christian if that person has been born again in the eyes of God. I don't mean has done a particular religious ritual. I've already preached about that. But if a person has been born again, has received new life, has the indwelling Holy Spirit, and has the restored image of God, if you have been born again, you are united with all other born-again persons in Christ. You probably didn't notice it because we say it every single Sunday, but I'll say it one more time. This is the passage from Corinthians if anyone is in Christ. Did you ever stop and think about, what does that mean? In Christ, there is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. If anyone is in Christ, Christian community is possible only because all Christians are in Christ. And Christ is in all Christians. How is Christ in all Christians? The Holy Spirit, of course. All Christians are in Christ. And Christ is in all Christians. So if Christian unity is real then, why don't we get along? Why is the church so divided? 
And believe me, the more you know about church history, the more you know that the human organization of the church has been divided, discordant, split into denominations and non-denominations, sects, groups, communities, since the very beginning. I mean, Peter and Paul were arguing about it from the very beginning. Division. I believe that's one of the main reasons why people don't come to church. Why should I go over there, they say. What's the point? I can have faith anywhere. I can worship God anywhere I want. In fact, it's a lot easier to worship God without having to deal with all those people. Right? I mean, how long have you been in the church? 15 minutes? You've already had an argument with somebody or heard about one. Believe me, I've been in the church a long time. And it's whatever denomination you're in, whatever size of congregation, personal, private, it's always a big old mishmash. It's a lot easier to worship God without all those other people. Sounds like Sartre, what is it? who said hell is other people, really. And the weight of the church's history, the weight of the church's history still oppresses nations and peoples all around the world. We can talk about history and the way that the church, Protestant and Catholic and Orthodox, has traveled around the world in history and depressed people, oppressed people, taken advantage of people, and we're still living the echoes of that. We can't apologize enough. The immoral and illegal things that church leaders have done. I mean, you can't start pointing fingers these days because it's all over. No matter, even if those things have been forgiven and adjudicated at law, they're really hard to forget. And the hateful and embarrassing actions and attitudes of people who screamingly identify as Christian. Honestly, and this is an honest statement, I sometimes feel like most of my evangelistic time is spent in apologizing for the church. Seriously. Not this church, not evangelical Presbyterians, just the church in general. When people know you're a church person, and everybody I know knows that about me, I'm the first person they come to, well, what about that then? You know, justify that. Explain that. Why are you still going to church? You know, all that. Honestly, it's very difficult. So, is Christian unity just a good idea that has gone horribly wrong? Well, no, it's not. But how can Christians experience unity? Remember when Jesus was first telling his disciples about the Holy Spirit? This is way back, like in the 13th chapter and before that in John 13, 14, 15, 16. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. That's one of the functions of the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you all things and remind you of everything Jesus said. He will glorify me, Jesus says, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The Holy Spirit I don't believe this is a blasphemous uh, reduction, but it's a true statement. The Holy Spirit is a conduit. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. And he doesn't say what he wants to say. He says what God said and Jesus said, and he says it to us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. How can we live in unity? Well, one of the ways we live in unity is that the Holy Spirit keeps bringing to our mind pictures, images of Christ the death of Christ, the life of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. He brings to our minds Christ's word, his wisdom, his love. What's the function? Why does the Holy Spirit do that? Because he's giving you nourishment for the life you're living. When you're going through a hard time, think about Jesus. When you're waiting for tomorrow, think about Jesus. When you are suffering with a new diagnosis or a new pink slip or, you know, the uncertainty of what's going to happen in your future, think about Christ. Think of what he said, what he did. Picture Christ. It is the function of the Holy Spirit to do that for you, and he does. The Holy Spirit inspires us, literally, in the literal sense. He inspires us, keeping Christ always before us so we can look for and recognize the image of Christ in other people. So we know what Jesus looks like, and we can see him in other people. One year during Lent, I prayed that every day I would see Jesus. And I didn't mean in a vision. I meant in somebody else. 
Where am I seeing Jesus? And at the end of the day, I recorded it in my journal. Where did I see Jesus today? That's a good exercise, by the way. It would be nice if we could take a pill and become more loving. <laughs> I should have taken that years ago. It would be nice if we could drink Kool-Aid and become like more patient, more kind or something. But good intentions don't pave the way to experiencing Christian unity. How many times have you tried to love someone who is just unlovable? How many times have they tried to love you? Christian community is possible only in Christ. Without Christ, we can't know our brothers and sisters. We can't grow closer to them because our ego gets in the way. Their ego gets in the way. Our ego gets in the way, and it keeps us separated. Scripture is clear. To be in Christ is to be saved. If we are in Christ, ipso facto, we are in God. If we are in God, of necessity, we are near God and we are with God. That's a reality whether we feel it or not. But only when we're living that reality of nearness, of inness to God, will we experience the consequent reality of nearness and oneness with our fellow Christians. In other words, the only way for us to feel unity with other Christians is to get closer to God. Let me show you another diagram. Hold on, hold on. It'll blow your mind. There's the other diagram. Now, what's that all about? How does that work? Well, there's God again, that big heart. And there are those two little circles, two little people. They're connected to God, but the horizontal line at the bottom doesn't connect them. It keeps them apart. Now, here's a geometry, geometry question, you know, early stages. In the world of this diagram, what's the only way those two little circles can get closer to each other? What's the only way those two little circles can get closer to each other? Not with an eraser, not with a pencil. In the world of that diagram, by going up toward the heart. If they go up, the closer you get to God, the closer you'll be to other people. Now that's just a, again, crude visual depiction of a theolo theological truth, but it's true. Human love is never going to get us closer to each other because human love fails. I'm always leery of reading 1 Corinthians 13 at weddings. Love never fails. Well, yes, it does. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> knock, knock. The news just arrived at your door. Love fails. Human love fails. They don't mean for it to fail, but it's twisted by sin. Even when we're born again, we're not perfect. We don't get born again into perfection. You can try all you want to be a loving person. One of these days, you're going to blow your temper. One of these days, you're going to say some catty word. One of these days, you might even do a very wounding thing. Love, human love is twisted by sin. It can never be strong enough to withstand the pressure of evil pushing against it. It can never be. If those two little circles try their hardest to get together, they can't. They've got to go to God. Because that line that separates them is sin, is evil. Only Christ can defeat that evil. We can't depend on our emotions or our intentions to get along. Experiencing oneness as Christians is only possible because God loves the Son, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves us, and the Holy Spirit is lavished on us. Brothers and sisters can live in Christian unity. Here's the good news, and this is serious. There are a lot of ways of doing that. Think about that. In a few minutes after I finish talking, we're going to do the two minutes of silence, and this might be something to think about. What are the ways God's calling you to live in unity? You may not feel like you want to live in unity. This is a matter of obeying what God has already put in motion. What about listening more than you speak? What about crucifying your arrogance? What about offering help and following through? What about praying when you say you're going to? What about summoning the courage to speak God's word, even a word of forgiveness? And I really do think the very best way to grow closer to God and to others is through prayer. Seriously. In the last five or six years of my life, my Christian life has changed because God really called me to prayer. It's huge. Intercessory prayer deepens your relationship with God and with the people around you. Not only the people you're praying for, but everybody else. I don't know how that happens, but I can tell you for sure that it does. 
Jesus told his disciples, a new command I give you. You've heard this scripture a billion times. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And those words direct us to our last question. Why is unity among Christians so important? So we talked about what is it? How can we experience it? Why does it matter? Jesus prays for the disciples who were there with him that night. But he also, in an incredible gesture, prays for the church of tomorrow, us. He prays that we'll be one just as they'll be one. The words of Jesus, if you read the whole prayer, they really highlight the gulf between the body of Christ and the unbelieving world. He keeps drawing that contrast over and over and over. Not so there's an us and them mentality, but to point out that the unbelieving world doesn't know God the Father, and it doesn't know the Father's love. That was Jesus' mission on earth. Jesus knew that night that he was going. He had tried to tell his disciples over and over, they just couldn't receive it. It was too hard. But he knew he was leaving, and he knew they weren't. And so he prays two things for them. He says that they may be one as we are one. And then he prays, just go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. That's the first thing he prays, protect them. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, he says. I'm asking you to protect them against the evil one. He just calls Satan out right there. He just says it. There's something going on here, and they're going to need protection. And then he says, sanctify them. And if that word throws you, substitute the word consecrate. Consecrate them to your holy mission. They mean the very same thing in the Greek. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them. Consecrate, sanctify. In other words, appoint them to the task. Give them the job description. Give them the assignment. As I was sent into the world, Jesus says, I have sent them. And that's where we are. We are protected and we have been sent. Even as we worship here, I think about this every Sunday, we have one foot out the door because we know our mission field is out there. The Tennells are leaving to go to exotic places and they have to get ready for that. But all of us are going out the door to home, to family, to neighborhood, to apartment building, to work, to school, to whatever. Disunity and distrust turn people away from the church and away from God and away from Christ. But Christian unity will show that Jesus came to show God's love. They will know we are Christians by our love. You've heard that song a billion times. But by our unity, they will know the God we serve and the Son who came to save us. Would you pray with me, please? Holy Father, we praise you for unity, for oneness, for the ethereal resonance of the circular entity that is the body of Christ. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for inviting us to become a member of the body of Christ and to share that body with all the others who have and will accept your invitation. Lord, I don't know why you had me preach this sermon. I really don't. But I know this is your word. I pray that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, will take it into our hearts, into our spirits, and that we may receive the truth that you want us to receive. We give you glory, God. Give us the opportunity to live in unity so that by our good works they will glorify our Father in heaven. Amen.